I'd like to welcome you to the Saudi Memorial Library uh, and the collection, uh, which is part of the exhibition known as Blood and Soul, the Russian Revolutions of 1917. In order to introduce this we, uh, exhibition, we have to explain that there were two revolutions in 1917, one in February and, of course, the Great October Revolution uh, of the latter part of the year. To begin with, Russia at that time, in 1917, was ruled by a czar or an emperor from the Romanov family. Nicholas and Alexander were the last czar and czarina of Russia. And of course, this window, as you can see, portrays the imperial family and parts of their life. For example, you have Tsar Nicholas II and uh, his wife, Alexander Fyodorovna. She was the princess of Darmstadt Hess, known as Princess Alex. And then here you have the actual scene from the coronation where the Tsar was permitted, upon his coronation, to go into the altar of the Uspensky Cathedral, where he received uh, communion under both species, like the bishops would do and the priests would do. Of course, his wife, Maria um, Alexandra Fyodorovna, had to receive it outside of the doors of the uh, icon screen. Here, for example, you have various certificates. This certificate here is a gramata that is hand signed by Patriarch Tikhon, who in 1917 became the Patriarch of Moscow. You can see his signature here. Smereni Tikhon Yepiskop, the humble Tikhon bishop. This is when he was bishop here in North America before he went back to Russia and was elected patriarch. That was the first patriarch in 200 years in Russia. The patriarchate was abolished under Peter the Great and was reestablished under the uh, period between the provisional government and the Bolshevik government. And they called an all church council in August of 2000. 1917. These are various certificates from the period, imperial period, as you can see. You have, for example, here Alexander Nevsky with the Livonians. This is probably from the period of World War One, as you can see the soldiers and the sailors and the nurses taking care of the wounded. Another certificate from the tricentenary or the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty. These are handwritten certificates, probably of no significance in the sense that they could actually be something very simple. Maybe even a grammar school, a, a diploma or something, but as you can see, the workmanship and the like is very important. These here are the actual relics of the imperial family who was murdered in July of 1917 by the Bolsheviks in Ekaterinburg. The first five pieces were received first after the DNA examined that they were parts of the bodies of the imperial family, and the last two were received in the last two and a half, three years. The icons that you could see, these belong to a Boyar family from Vyatsk and near Nizhny Novgorod. This is an original set. Russians would carry, even in the period of revolutions, would carry icons, some of ours, and a balalaika. It would be a normal thing to carry. And this is a set that belonged probably to a family, a wedding set, or a set that was in the icon corner or the red corner of the home. So let us proceed. We can see here the Grand Duchess Anastasia. Of course, you know the stories that when the family was murdered, the official notification was only that the Tsar was killed and that the family was allowed to tra be transferred to another place. But that did not happen. The entire family was murdered together, along with the doctor and the maid and others. And it wasn't until later, of course, there were many impostors, many impostors of Anastasia over the 70 year period, the famous one here in America known as Anna Anderson. And of course, it was proven later that they were not part of the imperial family. This is the Tsarevich, or the crown prince, uh, Alexei Nikolaevich. And as you can see here, he's portrayed with these mannequins next to Rasputin, who was the one who held a great influence over his mother, the Tsarina Alexandra, because he was a hemophiliac, a disease that he inherited from the royal family. And of course, Rasputin was blamed by many in the Russian government, amongst the Russian people, for having a very large part of the demise of the imperial family in Russia.
Okay, we'll proceed. In this window, you have stark contrast. It's already the transition. As you can see above, that's the imperial period with the double-headed eagles, patriarch, Tikkun, and the like, the coronation. Here you have already the beginning of the revolution. The first revolution in February and the second revolution in October. Uh, I have to admit that if you don't know about the ch change in calendar at that time, uh, the October Revolution was actually in November, according to the R calendar, and the February Revolution was actually in March. So you have to understand that there's a change in calendar. Here you have the two different worlds. Here's probably a grandfather who was probably in one of the uh, infantry or officer of a small group of cavalrymen wearing his Medal of St. George, which was typical because they would be very proud of that award with his daughter and grandson. As you can see, he has his epaulets still of his military degree, but yet his czarist medals and his double-headed eagles are already removed. Because after the first revolution in February, most of them were very confused as to what was transpiring. You know that um, eagles were still there, double-headed eagles were still there, but the czar had abdicated shortly tharafter in favor of his son, Tsarevich Alexei, and then he abdicated for his son in favor of his uncle. So as you could see, the Russian people were still confused whether or not the Tsar was the head of the government or not, but they established a provisional government under Prince Lvov, and then later Prince Lvov was uh, followed by Alexander Karensky. Here you see more Soviet items, of course, some of ours, as I said, balalaikas, some of ours, accordions, all were part of Russian life, whether they were on the white side or the red side. This is a garmoshka, like an accordion. And the balalaika and the samovar were in part of every home. If you remember the movie Dr. Shavago, written by, the book was based upon Boris Pasternak's Dr. Shavago. The balalaika was the central part of the entire movie. At the beginning, the balalaika played when the mother was being buried, and then at the end, you see the the daughter of Zhivago carrying the balalaika on her back with her boyfriend and going off in the distance where Zhivago's brother is in charge of a hydraulic uh, dam, and he turns and says to her, "Do you, does she play balalaika? Do you play balalaika?" And he, the boyfriend, turns around and says, "Does she play balalaika? She's a master." And so this is very part of the Russian soul, which is important to understand. Here you have just military pieces, sailors' outfits. This is the Trotsky hats from the Civil War. These are very typical of the Civil War period. And of course the fur hats, as you could see here, various officers and communist uh, men. Many of them were mi uh, mi mixes of imperial uniforms with things that they adopted. But the commissars already had more of a distinct one. Red armbands, Soviet medals already, already Soviet signies with the insignia of the hammer and sickle and the red star, which is a very important part of the Soviet October Revolution as opposed to the February Revolution. The February Revolution ushered in a new Duma, a new parliament, and it was basically uh, sort of the beginning of democracy in Russia. With the coming of the next revolution, that is all abolished, and they go under a Soviet state. So let's proceed. In each, in each of these cabinets, you'll see various items related to the exhibition and the history of the revolution. In this cabinet, for example, you have period items of Soviet interests, Soviet medals, military medals, the lacquer boxes, no longer depicting icons or fairy tales as they did in the early days after the revolution, but more very stark scenes of average life, Soviet life. All these pieces were made in this period of the Soviet Union. This book here is called Tiki Don. It's a book written by Mikhail Sholokhov. Sholokhov was one of the greatest writers of the Civil War period. And the book was not allowed to be published until 1945. 
by the Soviet government. Uh, it explained the typical life of a Cossack family torn by both the revolutions and the civil war. But this is a first edition copy of Mikhail Sholokhov's Tichy Don, All Quiet Along the Don. You have various items, again, of Soviet period. They tried to copy and emulate the work of Fabergé, which was very popular during the imperial period. And as you can see, many of these pieces resemble Fabergé pieces, but they're made of German Soviet silver. And they did this probably for the foreign trade, more for the foreign trade. This are, these are Russian stamps of the famous artist who was in charge of making all the backdrops for the Bolshoi opera, the Kirov opera. He was the set director. His name was Bilibin, and he also wrote all the books on Russian fairy tales. And these are skazki, or fairy tales. This is the Red Wagon. It's in Germany. Uh, it explains through paintings and through pictures the entire revolutionary period both the February Revolution and the October Revolution. You can visit it, but it's called the Red Wagon because inside that wagon basically is the entire story of the revolutionary period. Here, we're in Imperial Russia now, and here you have pieces from the Imperial Glass Factory of St. Petersburg, the priceless, as well as the uh, Easter eggs and the like that are etched from also from the glass factories. These books are from various uh, auction houses that will explain the value of these pieces in here. You have also the cup that was passed out on the coronation of Nicholas II. Of course, you know the story that when he was coronated, the government said they were going to be giving out free gifts, uh, pretzels and chocolate and cups. These cups were to be given to the people. Well, they thought that about 3,000 people would assemble on Khodinka field, and instead over 500,000 assembled, and there was a rush and a stampede, and 1,300 to 1,400 people were trampled to death in a ravine. So this already marked a black period at the time. The imperial family was very upset about what happened and visited many of the victims. There were still over 1,500 people that were injured, but the tragedy occurred and uh, it was a black time uh, for the imperial family because this happened actually upon his accession to the throne. Here you have various Fabergé pieces and the like. The frame has the Tsar Michael I, the first Romanov Tsar. The cross is from the tricentenary or the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty. On the back is the initial or the cipher of Michael I and Nicholas II. The swan egg with shaded enamel, Fabergé piece, as well as many of these spoons. They would be normal utensils for the homes in the imperial nobility. This cross here is a Fabergé priest hand blessing cross. It is marked with various markings, including artels. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is from the 11th artel. Artel meant a group of master silversmiths and goldsmiths who would work on one project and create a finished project. So each part of that cross could have been accomplished by a different master, and then when it was put together, it would be stamped the 11th or 12th, and in some cases, we even have this piece here, the letter opener marked 20th Artel. Then you have koshers. Koshers are cups. They were drinking cups, like punch bowl cups. <coughs> Excuse me. And the story was, as time went on, the punch bowl cups became trophies. Like you have trophies in the United States when you win a tournament, these became the trophies in Russia, uh, under Imperial Russia. Here you have vestments of a bishop and a priest. What's interesting about this set of vestments of this priest, it was the set that was sent to the United States for the exhibition in Chicago, and it is handmade of gold and silver bouillon. 
it's interesting that when they sent it, they sent it with an icon on the back of Nicholas, patron saint, St. Nicholas of Myra in Lycia. And as you can see, the spun gold and silver, it is the chrysanthemum pattern. And this was on exhibition in Chicago at the so-called World's Fair at that time. And it would have probably been used somewhere along the line during the coronation ceremonies. The gospel is from Paul I, the Tsar of Russia. It is silver, repoussé, and gold. Yep. The piece here is a piece of the actual casket of St. Patriarch Tikhon of Moscow, as well as an heir that he used when he was here in America, as well as a set of dikiri and trikiri, the candles that he used when he was here as bishop in America. This is an icon of St. Patriarch Tikhon with a piece of his body, or relic, with its side of it. As you can see, he's wearing the green mantia, a cloak of a patriarch, as opposed to a blue, which would be for a metropolitan, a red for an archbishop, or purple for a bishop. The set of Panagia is an old set with rubies, and it would be the Virgin Mary, Christ, and the center would be the cross. In this cabinet, you have the Patriarch Tikhon's family icon, the family icon of the Belovin family. It is made with uh, seed pearls and the like from the Amur River, which was in Siberia on the border of China. And the piece, as you can see, is all intricately repoussé. It's the version of Smolensk. The frame that you see in the corner there is the Dacha frame. A dacha was a house, a country house, and the frame is one of the window frames. And inside is a picture of the Tsarevich Alexei Nikolaevich, the crown prince of the imperial family, who was also murdered along with his family. In front of there is a piece of relic, a bone, of his great aunt, the Grand Duchess Elizabeth, whose husband was assassinated, and later she became a nun, and she became a nurse, and uh, she was also murdered along with her Kalenik, or her assistant, and this is a relic from her body. She was buried uh, in the church of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, uh, in Gethsemane Garden. And it's interesting to note that Prince Philip of England's mother, the former Princess Andrea of Greece is also buried in this same church because Prince Philip's mother became a nun, a Greek Orthodox nun. Here you have various items, Fabergé pieces, cutlery, one of the cups that Nicholas II brought back from his trip to India when he was still a crown prince or Tsarevich. He had gone on a world tour before he became Tsar. He went to Siam, he was a guest of the King of Siam, he went to India, he went to various other countries, including even Japan before the 1905 uh, war. Here you have <coughs> items from the Lomonosov factory, porcelain factory. You also have the Ipetrahilion or the stole of uh, Saint Seraphim of Sarotsk. Here you have the first book that was written on the occasion in 1903 of the canonization of St. Seraphim of Sarovsk. It was the canonization, his making of a saint, uh, where Nicholas II himself attended. Here you have a book from the Kiev saints of uh, the Kiev Pachaska Lavra. It's St. Theodosius and St. Anthony of the Caves. And it's, these are the books that would be available at that time if people made pilgrimages to the various monasteries. As time went on, these were confiscated, destroyed, burned, or the like. So it's very unusual that we even have some of them left for us today. This here is another dacha frame with the icon of St. Theodosius of Chernigo, one of the famous saints of the Chernigo. Here we have some items from the Falvey Rare Books Collection. It's newspapers that would explain how and what about the revolution. Again, it's very confusing for most people to think that there were two revolutions. One, the February, was the first one. That is when the Tsar eventually abdicated a couple of days later. 
and then you have the Bolsheviks revolting against the Kerensky government or the provisional government and establishing Soviet control over the country coming in the October Revolution. But the information was coming out of Russia in such spurts that they did not know who really was in charge. Whereas, was it the Kerensky government of the cadets, Social Democrats? Was it the Mensheviks? Or was it the Bolsheviks? Or was it even the monarchists and the whites and the reds? That ushered in a period of a civil war that lasted several years between the White Army and the Red Army, many of whom generals we have on posters throughout the library. For example, that is the, uh, the first one, or the, excuse me, the second one is General Wrangel. The second, third one would be uh, General Denikin. Then you have Admiral Kolchak, and then you have Kornilov. All these were in charge of different portions of the White Army following the Kerensky's government's taking over in 1917. Kornilov, or Kornilov was responsible, many people feel, for the actual overthrow eventually of the Kerensky government because his men mutinied against the provisional government. Uh, Wrangel was the one who was in charge of the southern part of the White Army that went through Crimea eventually escaping through Crimea and on ships and ending up in Yugoslavia, in Stremski Karlovci in Serbia. Here you have posters that would explain pretty much the coronation of the imperial family, Nicholas II, portrait of the family together. Then, of course, the Bloody Sunday and the Cossacks having reprisals against demonstrators at the time. Then you have a picture of Kerensky sitting in his office in the Kremlin. Very unusual to see that picture. Then, of course, Lenin arriving in Petrograd to begin his rhetoric to start the Second Revolution. Patriot Tikhon, followed by a typical Soviet uh, revolutionary um, poster. Then, of course, Leon Trotsky, one of the leaders of the revolution, the second Bolshevik revolution. Then you have already, in the last three there, you have already the beginning of the civil war, the extermination of the imperial family in the basement of the Apatyev house, as you can see, and already the last one, talking about the destruction of the church, of its valuables, the confiscation of religious items, and the actual upheaval and change of the people. So basically this is what the collection of Blood and Soul is about. It's to explain uh, through, maybe I can explain it best by this painting here. Here you see a painting that was made specifically by someone at the time of Perestroika. It represents Christ from a typical icon. And then you have the candles of the faith of the people. And you have the towers of the Kremlin. But more importantly, this tower here is the Ivan the Great Bell Tower, signified by the bells, one of which even becomes encompasses the eye of Jesus. Then you have the angel who is Saint Michael the Archangel trumpeting the, the upheaval, the flames, as you see, which is part of his beard, is the total destruction of Russia. Yet the soul of Russia remains intact even after the spilling of the blood because in the end, after 75 years of Soviet atheism, the church and the country was born out of the ashes. And again, because of the soul, the dusha of the Russian people, it was uh, spilled blood, but mostly it was the restoration of what of the, of the real Russian soul, the, the nation. Not the Tsar, but of the people, and of the people's souls. So that would explain it the best that we can. Okay? Thank you. I think in conclusion to the video tour, that I have just given you of the uh, exhibition Blood and Soul, I think it's important that I conclude it with a statement that was just recently published by 
His Holiness Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, which was delivered by him at the Great Vesper Service on the Feast of the Nativity, or Christmas, on January 7, 2017, at the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow. As I read his words, what struck me is this one paragraph. He wrote, We have entered the year of the centenary of the tragic events in the history of our motherland. From that year began the mass closures of churches, the desecration of shrines, the killing of clergy, and of the faithful people. The Russian land stained with blood, and in the end were almost wiped out all signs of a religious people. Perhaps the witnesses of these events at that time, seeing them at close range, could not see God's presence in history. And many have said, Lord, where were you? when the cathedrals were blown up, when the famous Trinity Sergius Lavra was closed, when the desecrated holy relics were completely obliterated, when clergy and faithful were shot and massacred or executed, probably not one person then asked God, where are you? and did not see the miracle of God. But after this full century, a hundred years, we can look at all these past years from a different angle. Today we stand in the revival of the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. Thousands and thousands of temples built throughout the country, but most importantly, the people turning back to their faith. And then we begin to understand that this is not ran random. We're those tragic pages in the history of our motherland. The mystery of God is not fully disclosed to us. Why our nation had passed the bloody roads. Why such a huge sacrifice was made. But the fact that a century phenomenon completes the glory of God shows to all of us, God's miracle.